Hey everybody, welcome back. It's Mr. G here again. Today we're going to be covering things like atomic structure, electrical charge, voltage, current, and resistance. So again, this is for our Tech 101 electronics course. The material we're going to be coming from our textbook today. So our textbook is again Principles of Electric Circuits, Floyd and Bakla Conventional Current Flow, 10th edition. So, atomic structure. The world is made up of things called atoms. And an atom contains a uh, bunch of parts that we need to be aware of. So there's a center of the atom, which is called the nucleus of the atom. And then there are rings outside. So in the nucleus of the atom, we have protons, positively charged. In the rings, we have electrons, so little electrons, and they are negatively charged. So there's a number of electrons in the shells. And for every electron, we have protons. So that the atom remains balanced. So we got one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six. I will throw one more in here. Now, different materials have different structures of atoms. Different number of electrons, different number of protons. Oh, sorry, of, uh, yes, of protons. So what we are worried about or concerned about is electricity. How do or how does electricity move from atom to atom inside a material? So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So electricity by definition, is a movement of electrons. So movement of electrons. So if I had a material, and I'm going to say that this is a piece of copper wire that I have. And we all know that electricity flows through copper. So it flows through the wires in our house and so forth. So copper must conduct electricity, but how? How does it actually work? So basically, if we are looking at movement of electrons as electricity, so to get the electricity to flow from one side of the wire through the wire to the other side of the wire, something must cause it to flow. So if you take just a bare 
copper wire. So just a piece of copper wire like this. We know that because of the atomic structure that there are electrons that are inside this wire. We know that as part of the atom that makes up this wire. But what actually gets them to move? That is the goal of today. We have to figure out what's causing the electrons to move through that wire giving us electricity. Because we know that there's electrons in there But they're not moving. There's no electricity flowing in this wire right now as I hold it in my hand. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's no electricity flowing, but we need to actually get some in there. So what we have to do in order to get electricity to flow, to get those electrons to move, is we have to apply energy. So we apply energy, and in our case, it's in the form of a voltage in a battery. So, if I was to hook up this battery to that copper wire, the battery would supply energy to get the electrons to move. Now, we have to figure out how that works at the molecular level and which direction are the electrons actually going. So let's take a look. If we look back at the atom again, there's the nucleus and then there's rings that go around it, otherwise known as shells. And if I take that copper wire and I blow it all the way up so that we can actually see the atoms inside, the atoms are going to look like this. A copper atom has one electron in the outermost shell. So any good conductor has one electron in the outermost shell. The outermost shell is called the valence shell. So the valence shell of an atom so again, we've got our nucleus in here, so that's the nucleus of the atom. But what we're concerned with is the electrons in the valence shell. They are the ones that move, causing electricity. So, what happens? Well. For every electron that we have, we have a proton. And there's an attraction between a negatively charged electron and a positively charged proton. There is an attraction between them. And that's what keeps the electron actually part of the atom. But what happens when we apply voltage or energy to that structure. The energy is absorbed in the electrons in the outermost shell. So what happens is, is those electrons get that energy and that energy allows them to break free from the hole that the atom has on it. 
So it breaks free from that hold. So now that electron is free of the atom. It has moved up into what is known the conduction band of energy. And that electron is now free to move. It no longer is attached to that atom. This electron is free to move. It's no longer attached. This electron is free to move. It's no longer attached. When the electron leaves, the negative charge goes with it. So then the rest of the atom has a net positive charge because one of the negative things has left. So now the atom has a positive charge. Now we know that opposites attract. So we know that electrons, where are they going to want to go? So once they're free, they're going to want to go to some place that is positive. So if I took my battery, like in the previous example, so I'm applying some voltage and that's my energy, and these atoms are inside the copper. So where are these electrons going to go? So they are going to travel through the copper since they are negatively charged. The biggest thing that attracts them is the biggest positive charge. So those electrons are going to try and move. Like so. So as the electrons move, they all want to go to where the big positive charge is, which is on that battery. Now, as the electrons move, they start to lose their energy. So as this electron starts to move going this way, so this electron here is moving, causing him, or what's causing him to move is the energy. The movement is causing him to lose some energy. Eventually, he sees this positive atom here, and he will fall back into the hole that was abandoned by this guy. This guy makes his way over here, and eventually is all happy because he ends up down here. This electron will make his way and he'll fall into the hole that was here. An electron will come up from this area and fall into here and fill up that hole. So the electrons fall back into the hole. They're attracted to the positive part of the atom. So once one electron leaves, another one will eventually take its place. It will then absorb more energy and it will escape again and follow the previous electron. Eventually the end goal of all of the electrons are to end up all down here. So with every electron that ends up down here, one has to take its place. Or else we don't have copper when we're all done. And this continues until the energy in the battery is gone. So the movement of these electrons inside the material is called current. And that's the basis for electricity. 
So electricity is current. Current is a movement of electrons through a material. What causes the current? The energy from a voltage. So the voltage is what we call the potential. It's the energy that is absorbed by the electrons which cause them to move. Where do they want to move? They want to go to where the positive is. Because the electrons are negatively charged, they want to eventually arrive at the thing that is the most positive, which is the positive terminal of the battery. And eventually, if you looked inside a battery, you'll find that all of the electrons in a battery are over here. When the battery is full, and then all of the electrons leave and they end up over on this side when the battery is empty. So that is at the atomic level what is actually happening when we have current flow or electricity flowing through a wire. So, the outermost band of any atom is called a valence shell. That's where the electrons sit that move in the electricity. So, when they absorb the energy, they leave and enter this conduction band, a higher level of energy, and are able to flow and move from one atom to another atom to another atom and eventually end up at the big positive thing at the end. So, if we go back to our little diagram here, I'm going to put a bunch of electrons in the valence shell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we'll go eight. Eight electrons in the valence shell. Any atom can contain one to eight electrons in the valence shell. And remember, those are the electrons that we're concerned with because those are the ones that move during electricity. So, in order for the electron to leave, it has to absorb energy and enough energy to enter what's known as the conduction band. Now, if I was to apply energy to this atom, so let's just say there's some energy that I'm applying to this atom. The electrons in the outermost shell are going to each absorb some of that energy. So let's just pretend that I had an energy level that was uh, 8. No units, anything. I'm just saying energy level of 8. If I have 8 electrons, each electron is going to absorb one part of that energy. Let's 
let's pretend that in order to get the electron to leave the structure of the atom, let's pretend it takes five pieces of energy in order to leave. So if I have eight pieces of energy, each electron is going to get one. That's not enough energy to overpower the atom so that that electron can leave. Let's take a different atom. Let's take the example of a copper atom. A copper atom has one electron in the outermost shell. Again, I have eight units of energy applied. Those eight units of energy are going to be absorbed in one electron. So it's not divided amongst all of them, it's absorbed by one. If it takes a minimum of five energy units for that electron to break free and enter into the conduction band, we have more than enough. So that electron will absorb energy, have enough energy to enter into the conduction band and then move from atom to atom and be part of the electricity. So the fewer the number of electrons that there are in the valence shell, the more conductive the actual material becomes. So, we have things that are known as conductors. We have other things known as insulators. And then we have things that are known as semiconductors. Conductors are typically metal. So uh, things like copper and gold and silver, platinum, things like that. Conductors typically have one electron in the valence shell. one. Insulators typically have eight electrons in the valence shell. So a conductor, that one electron can easily absorb enough energy to leave. The insulator, eight of those electrons have to absorb the energy so they only get one-eighth Therefore, not enough energy for them to enter the conduction band. So an insulator or insulated material does not conduct electricity under normal circumstances. Then there are semiconductors. Now, semiconductor is a specific type of metal or a specific type of uh, material that will conduct or not depending on the circumstances and typically anywhere from four to five electrons. In the valence shell. So a conductor easily conducts electricity, an insulator does not, and a semiconductor, well, it conducts sometimes, and it doesn't conduct sometimes. So sometimes it does, Sometimes it doesn't, depending on the situation. 
So examples of conductors can be things like, again, copper and silver and gold, insulators, rubber, plastic, wood, Semiconductor materials, there are three major semiconductor materials. There is silicon, germanium, and the one that everybody forgets but is the most common, carbon. So three main types of semiconductor material. As you move forward in your study of electronics, you will start to use semiconductors in things like transistors. In this course, semiconductor materials make up the material that is used in our resistors in our parts kit. So they are carbon-based resistors. So, conductors, insulators, and then we got semiconductors. Now, I made a statement here about insulators. And the statement said that insulators do not conduct electricity under normal conditions. So what does that actually mean? Well, what it means is if you take a piece of wood or a piece of rubber, which is an insulative material. If you apply enough energy to it, you can actually get it to conduct electricity. So think about it like this. If we go back, remember this is the insulator material. We got eight electrons in that shell. If we need a minimum of five energy units, if I applied a very large amount of energy, so not 8, but let's say 100 energy units, that would be more than enough to get those electrons to move. So, the statement saying that insulators do not conduct electricity under normal circumstances, that means in the realm of what they are designed to do. But I can get electricity to flow through wood if I apply enough energy to it. Perfect example, a bolt of lightning hitting a tree. The bolt of lightning is more than enough energy to get electrons to move in a piece of wood. So you can actually cause electrons to move in a piece of wood if you apply enough voltage or enough energy to it. Okay? So we know so far that electricity is made up of movement of electrons. Now, electrons themselves are very, 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 very small. By themselves, they are very insignificant. So I'm going to give you an example. So here is a swimming pool. In the swimming pool, hey look, there we'll even have a diving board. We got some stairs for people to get out. It's a swimming pool. Okay? So you've got a swimming pool. I'm going to take one drop of water and put it in the swimming pool. Eh, two drops of water in the swimming pool. Those drops of water are so small compared to the size of the swimming pool that they are actually insignificant. You're not going to tell somebody that you've, you know, you've put two drops of water in your swimming pool and you're not going to call somebody over and go, let's go swimming, there's water in my swimming pool. 
But if I started to dump buckets of water into the swimming pool, that would make a difference. Now we know that there are so many drops of water inside the bucket. A drop by itself doesn't mean anything, it's insignificant. But when you combine a whole bunch of them together and put them into a bucket, and then you dump the bucket into the swimming pool, it makes a difference. Electricity is the same way. So, we would have individual electrons by themselves are insignificant. But when we group a bunch of them together, put them in a bucket, it becomes significant. That bucket is what we call a coulomb. A coulomb is a unit of charge. So how many electrons fit into the bucket? Well, it's 6.24 times 10 to the 18th electrons make up one coulomb. So, for those of you Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen zeros. That number is that number. So we got whatever that number happens to be. Six hundred and twenty-four bazillion. Whatever that number is, I have no idea. But that many electrons fit into this bucket that we're calling a coulomb. And that is a unit of charge. Alright, so what does that all mean? So we know that a movement of electrons is electricity, and we call that current. Now if I take this little piece of wire, and I know there is electrons in that wire, because they make up part of the atomic structure of that wire. But if I take that wire and just leave it there like this, that wire is not flowing any electricity. There are no electrons moving in that wire. So therefore there's no current in that wire. If I was to apply energy to that wire, that energy is absorbed by the valence electrons, they can now enter the conduction band and they can actually start to move. And that's what we get, electricity. So the movement of electrons is what's known as current. But how much? So we have our unit of charge, one coulomb. So inside this circle, I have one coulomb worth of electrons. So that means I have 6.24 times 10 to the 18th electrons inside that circle. I have something over here called point P. This is a conductor. If one coulomb passes by point P at a rate of one coulomb per second, that is considered one amp of current flow. So, our movement of electrons has a 
has a rate. They move at a particular rate. If I have one coulomb flowing per second, I have one amp of current. If I have two coulombs flowing per second, I have two amps. If I have two coulombs flowing over two seconds, I have one amp. If I have half a coulomb flowing per second, I have half an amp. So, measurement of current is the rate of flow of electrons. So the rate at which the electrons are moving. That's what we consider current. And that rate is based on one coulomb per second gives me one amp of current flow. And again, a coulomb is a huge number, 6.24 times 10 to the 18th electrons that are all moving together. So that is current. So, current. From the atomic point of view, current is a movement of electrons. So a flow of electrons. There are two types of current. One is referred to as electron current. The other is what's known as conventional current. In electron current flow, we focus on the negatively charged electrons. Where do the electrons want to go? They want to go to somewhere that is positive. So the flow is from negative to positive. So if we focus on the movement of the electrons themselves, it goes from negative to positive. Conventional current doesn't focus on the electrons. Conventional current states that electricity flows from positive to negative. Now, the story behind this. Years ago, when we first started studying electricity. So 200 and some odd years ago, 300 years ago, when they started to look at electricity, they believed that electricity was flowing from a positive source to a negative source. That was the assumption that was made. Based on that assumption, they created rules, mathematics, and all things that have to do with electricity were based in early days around this concept. That was the conventional way of thinking back then. 
that electricity flowed from positive to negative. After all of that, we had test equipment that were developed over the years. So electron microscopes. And we were able to discover that electricity is really the electrons in the atomic structure that are moving. And the electrons are negatively charged. And where does a negatively charged thing want to go? To the positive. So, electron, if we monitored the electrons, which they discovered later, electricity really flows from negative to positive. Problem is, we've already got all these rules and all these theorems and all the mathematics that are supporting this theory or that were created around this theory. So we end up with two current flow scenarios. If we are focusing on the electrons, that is electron current flow. If we are not, that is conventional current flow. In our program, if you remember our book, we do conventional current flow theory, not electron current flow. So from this course, from this point onwards, when I say current and current flow, I am talking about conventional current flow. If I am focusing on the electrons, which is more scientific, I will say electron current flow or the flow of electrons. Okay? But when we're talking current, just regular current in a circuit, it is conventional current which flows from positive to negative. So our textbook is based on conventional current theory. So the energy that those electrons need to get comes from what's known as voltage. The unit for the voltage is volt. In this particular class, we focus on what's known as DC voltage, which causes DC current flow. Now what does that mean? DC stands for direct current. Direct current is current that is flowing in one direction. and one direction only. So, if I have a battery with a positive and a negative terminal, this terminal is always going to be positive, this terminal is always going to be negative. So current will always flow Again, from positive to negative. Since these things never switch, current will always flow in that same direction. So, as an example, if I take a circuit, 
This is the symbol in electronic circuit for a voltage supply. The two straight lines represent DC, where the large line is the positive side and the small line is the negative side. If I was to take that battery, that DC supply, and put it through a light bulb, Electricity will flow through the light bulb in this direction constantly. Because electricity, remember conventional current flow, flows from positive to negative. So as we loop around, the direction never changes. So this is what they call direct current or DC. So an example, a uh, most popular example of DC supply is a battery. It provides current that flows from one terminal, which is the positive, to the negative terminal which is the negative or to yeah the other terminal which is negative so from positive to negative always flowing through the light bulb in the same direction so that current is always flowing through the light bulb in the same direction as opposed to AC voltage. The symbol for an AC supply looks like this. Same light bulb, but AC is called alternating current and the direction actually changes. So half of the cycle, the current goes this way. For the other half of the cycle, the current goes back this way. And they alternate. We will get introduced to AC voltage and alternating current later in this course. It is an introductory into the next course you'll be doing. So the focus of this course, Tech 101, is based on direct current. So that scenario. So in our case, a battery supplying direct current. So the battery is a DC voltage that's providing the energy to get the electricity to flow. All right. So we now have a battery or a DC voltage and we have some wires and that's what's going to conduct our electricity. The next element that we have to introduce is what's known as resistance. In lesson one, I talked a little bit about resistance. The symbol in the schematic looks like this. That is a resistor. Its job is to limit the amount of current that flows through the circuit. So if we have a supply, 
and we have a loop that joins the positive side of our voltage supply to the negative supply, we will then have current flowing. How much current flows is dependent upon this resistance value. So the resistor, think of the shape. If this was a road, if you had a nice smooth road, you could go faster. But if you have a bumpy road, you have to limit your speed. So the job of the resistor is to limit the amount of current that flows through a circuit. There are many types of resistors. I have two common ones here. These ones are the most common type that you're going to see in your parts kit. These are a power type resistor that can handle lots of heat and energy. But basically, that is a resistor. The unit for the resistor is the ohm, and the symbol is the Greek letter omega. So resistance, measured in ohms, is the opposition to current flow. It limits current flow. The higher the resistance, the less current we have flowing. The lower the resistance, the more current we can have flowing. So we're going to take a look at these resistor values. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at resistors. So the measurement of resistors are in ohms. The question becomes, how many ohms? Resistors look like this. This is a very, very common style of resistor. It's a carbon-based resistor. This is what makes up the resistors that are in your parts crib or your parts kit. The resistors physically are very small. It would be hard to write numbers on here and make them legible. So many years ago, what was decided was to create a universal resistor color code. The resistor color code, what it does is each color band represents a number. So we can look at the color of the bands that are painted on the resistor and we can figure out what numbers they represent and we can figure out then what value of resistance this resistor has. So, the first kind of resistor that we have is what's known as a four band resistor. It has four bands of color. Typically, there are three bands of color that are grouped together. One, two, and three. And then one that's kind of spaced off by itself, which is the fourth. What these bands represent, <clears throat> this band is the first digit in the value of the resistor. This band of color represents the second digit in the value of the resistor. 
The third band is what's known as the multiplier. So basically it is a factor of 10. So 10 to the something. In other words, how many zeros? The fourth band that stands off by itself is the tolerance. So the first band of color represents the first digit, the second band of color represents the second digit, and the third band of color represents the multiplier. How many zeros follow? Then we have the fourth band of color which represents the tolerance. So this resistor that I have in my hand here the colors are yellow, violet, brown, gold. So the first band of color is yellow, the second band is violet, the third band is brown, and the fourth band is gold. So yellow is our first digit, violet is our second digit, brown is our number of zeros, and gold is our tolerance. So now to figure out any resistor value, we need to know what each of the colors represent. And again, this is a universal system. And it kind of goes like this. So, so the resistor color code goes like this. There are 10 digits from 0 through to 9. The first color is black. The next is brown red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, gray, and white. Black represents zero, brown represents one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So if I go back to my example, yellow is the first digit. Yellow represents the digit 4. Violet is the next color representing 7. Brown is 1, 0. So 1, 0. And then we'll get to the tolerance in a minute. So this resistor this resistor here is 470 ohms. So now as far as the 
multiplier. People look at it differently. It's the multiplier. When I do it, I think of it as number of zeros. And that's just my way. But some people look at it and say, well, I have 4, 7, 4, 7 times 10 to the power of brown 1. So 10 to the power of 1. So 47 times 10 to the power of 1. 10 to the power of 1 is 10. 47 times 10 is 470 ohms. So there's no right and wrong way to think about it. So whatever method works for you. I look at it and I say, okay, well, brown represents one zero. Some people look at it mathematically and it's times 10 to the power of 1. So 47 times 10 to the power of 1 is 470. So however you want to represent it, it's perfectly fine. This is mathematical and the other is just creating a set of numbers. So now we're left with the tolerance. In a basic four band resistor, we have tolerance. Now, tolerance is a factor uh, that takes into account manufacturing error. So, if you are creating resistors and you are creating a million resistors a day, you cannot guarantee somebody that the resistor that you created at 8 o'clock in the morning is going to be exactly the same as the resistor that you created at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So we put in tolerance. So tolerance is a range that says that the resistor could be out of value by this much and it's still good. So some of the tolerance colors we have brown, red, gold, silver. Brown is 1%, red is 2%, gold is 5%, silver is 10%. So in a typical, regular resistor, four band resistor, you could come across those colors as your tolerance. In a lot of resistors nowadays, you're going to find 2 and 5% tolerance values. So, back to our example, our example was gold. So our value for the resistor is 470 ohms plus or minus 5%. So 5%. So that means that every resistor that is manufactured on that day, that's a gold band resistor, will be within 5% of 470 ohms. That's what the manufacturer tells you. Okay, so the manufacturer will tell you that the resistors that were spitting out that day are within 5% of this value. Now, if you look back on this video, when I first started talking about the resistor color code, when I wrote them down, I wrote down 
B B R O Y G B V G W. And then I filled in the rest of the color. It's a very good idea to memorize this color code. When I was studying electronics, we came up with a nursery rhyme that laid out all of these letters. And it went something like this. Bad beer rots our young guts, but vodka goes well. Again, bad beer rots our young guts, but vodka goes well. Fits in with the student lifestyle. So, even to this day, when I write down those colors, in my head, I'm given that little rhyme. And then all I have to remember is black comes before brown and blue because you have three B's. You have two G's, so green comes before gray. Not only is this the resistor color code, but this color code is used in a lot of different places in electronics. When you look at the colors of the wires in connectors, in cables, a lot of them go by this resistor or this color code. So that means the wire that is in pin one of the connector will be brown. The wire that is in pin two of the connector will be red. The wire that is in pin 3 will be orange, etc, etc, etc. So, learn this color code. It is very, very uh, important in electronics. You will come across it many, many times. So let's do an example. So if I had the colors brown, black, red, silver. That would translate into first digit, second digit, number of zeros. Red represents two, so therefore two zeros. Silver represents plus or minus 10%. So this is 1,000 ohms plus or minus 10%. So what does the tolerance actually mean? Well, when you look at it, 1,000 ohms plus or minus 10%. So that means that this resistor if it's within tolerance, what is 10% of a thousand? So 10% of a thousand is a hundred. So that means that this resistor, so this 1000 ohm resistor, could be anywhere between 900 ohms and 1100 ohms. So this is minus 10% and this is plus 10%. So if I had a 1000 ohm resistor at 10%, that means that the value of the resistor that you actually have in your hand, that value of that resistor would be somewhere between those things. So if we went back to this example, 470 ohms, plus or minus 5%. What is 5% of 470? Then you take the minimum 
and the maximum value. And they'll give you a range. So if I took this resistor and I actually measured it. So in order to measure, I require a multimeter that is set to measure resistance ohms. And if I was to take these leads now and connect it to this resistor, I am reading 0 0.460 kilo ohms. So that works out to be 460 ohms. So that's what I'm reading with this. So if you remember from lesson one, going from this is kilo into just standard, uh, so 0 0.460 kilo is actually 460. So 460. So the question becomes, is this resistor within tolerance? Okay, so is this 460, is it within 5% of what it's supposed to be? And in our case, the answer is yes. So this resistor is within tolerance. All right, so moving on, there is another resistor and this one has five bands. This is what's known as a precision resistor. It has five bands of color. It uses the same color code as the four band resistor. But there's a difference. So this one actually has five bands of color. Four of them are normally grouped together and then one off by itself. In this case we have the first digit, the second digit, the third digit, and then the multiplier. And our tolerance. Five band or precision resistors are normally more accurate than a typical four band resistor. So in the example that we have, this 470 ohm resistor, so let me just, so I have a 470 ohm resistor. This is first digit, second digit multiplier. Using the resistor color code, what is the next largest possible value that I could have? Digit, digit, multiplier. So the next possible value I could have is 480 ohms. So here I have yellow and violet and then number of zeros. So I want to increase a digit. So there's yellow. Then I've got the next digit up from here in color wise is gray and then my number of zeros. I don't have any possible value in between. So I can go from 470 to 480 and nothing in between. 
Let me exaggerate that. What if that was 470 mega ohms? The next value I could have was 480 mega ohms. That's a big difference between those two. That's 10 mega ohms difference between those two values. What the five band precision style resistor does is it actually gives us an extra digit to get more accurate results. So instead of 470 going to 480, I can actually go 471. Much more precise. So this is how it works. First band, second band, third band. First digit, second digit, third digit, and then the multiplier. So if I looked at my 471 ohm resistor, that would be yellow, violet, same as before, third digit is a 1, so that is brown. How many zeros follow? There are no zeros. So what represents no zeros? Where's my color chart back again? Oh, just trying to find my little color chart. There we go. What represents zero zeros? Black. Black. So, first digit, second digit, third digit. How many zeros? There are no zeros. Tolerances. Since the resistors are higher quality and higher precision, they also have higher tolerances. So typically the values of tolerances that we can see is 2%, 1%, 0.5%, 0.25%, 0.25%, and 0.1%. So the tolerance colors are red, brown, green, blue, and violet. So the tolerance values in a precision resistor could actually have different colors. So a five band precision resistor is much more precise on the value because we have an extra significant digit and it is also typically tighter on the tolerances. So again 2%, 1%, half a percent, quarter of a percent, a tenth of a percent. So that is the five band precision resistor. So that completes most of today's topics. Today's lecture material 
can be found in Principles of Electronic Circuits, 10th edition Conventional Current Flow from Floyd and Buckla. And we are looking at things from chapter number two. Where are we? There we go. Chapter number two, Atomic Structure, Current, Voltage, Resistance, and so forth. So, do some reading. I hope this is helping. Until next time, everybody stay safe. Take care.